Before we begin, I'm just going to write these down so we save time in the lecture. These are the Okay, and then we have these. Okay, good morning. Um, right, all right, well, uh, today, so what we want to do is we want to return to this problem, the distinguishing of these domino states, and uh, also talk a bit about the asymptotic LOCC, just this, the general problem. This is the concrete example that we're using to motivate uh, the, the, pro the, the whole subject. And then, so I, the, what I'm thinking time-wise is that this will probably go maybe half the lecture, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about entanglement monotones and entanglement transformations. Uh, because that's something that's sort of central to theory of LOCC and uh, also very useful when you're trying to compute whether or not you can transform one quantum state to another. This, uh, this theory of entanglement monotones is very helpful. All right. Okay, so, so if you remember at the end of the, the lecture yesterday, um, we introduced this so we introduced the, the, the pseudo-weak measurements. And what that did is that allowed, allowed us to take a, a very general um, measurements and we could basically decompose it into a sequence of, of, of smaller measurements. And actually, more precisely, um, we could, we could st stop it at any point. So if you remember, if we had the, the, the picture to keep in mind is that if we had a three outcome measurement like this, uh, we could actually replace it with one where we, we halt it here, right? And then we can continue it later on. And the overall probabilities are preserved of each of these outcomes. So that was critical. So basically, we can make this replacement, and we don't change the overall probabilities. OK, so we're going to use this now. Um, and, and the way we're going to do it is we're going to take a, an LCC protocol, and we're going to basically Think of it as like a continuous evolution, right? Because we, we want to be able to perturb our states ever so slightly, and we want to have control over that. So we're going to take our local measurements, and we're going to invoke this pseudo-weak pseudo measurement and stop it at appropriate times. Whenever we, when it, we're going to demand some time that we can stop the evolution of the states. So let me be a bit more precise on this. OK. All right, so the task is that for every epsilon, we want an n round protocol. So we want a finite round LOCC protocol that. <coughs> will uh, distinguish tau 1 and tau 2 with probability, error probability, uh, 
less than epsilon. And if we can do this, then we will have shown that actually these are distinguishable by the closure of LOCC, right? Because we can, we can construct a sequence of protocols. Of course, this n may or may not depend on epsilon in general. Actually, it will depend on epsilon. Uh, but this is, this is what we want, want to do. Okay. And, and one thing that we, we mentioned, if the, these guys are orthogonal, so tau 1, tau 2 is 0, um, it doesn't matter the original probabilities. Right, so the a priori probabilities won't matter if we demand perfect discrimination. So what I want to assume is uh, that we're going to start off with, with the ensemble with P1 greater than P2. Okay, so this is, we're just going to start off with this. And you'll see, that it, it's, I mean, this isn't completely necessary, but it's going to make our analysis a bit easier. And what I want to do now is um, I want to consider... Uh, in Enron protocol, with error probability less than epsilon, and what I want to track now, I want to track how this, how these probabilities evolve throughout the protocol. Okay, so uh, we begin with uh, we a, slight, a slight bias toward tau one. Um, and we're going to make a series of measurements, local measurements, and eventually what we want is, as someone was pointing, or the goal, as we discussed yesterday, using this, this Bayesian updating idea, is that we want either the probability of P1 to go to 1, or the probability of P2 to go to 1, right? And then, then we will have identified the states. So uh, we're, what we're going to do is we're just going to chart this. So on the y-axis here, this is going to be the the difference of P1 given lambda minus P2 given lambda. So let's say this is, this would be 1 here. Uh, and then on the x-axis is going to be rounds. Okay, so at 0 round, initially, uh, we have P1 is greater than, than P2. So maybe we'll start off somewhere here. Okay, and then um, let's go to the, the, the first round here. Make sure I have enough room for all this. And let's say Alice goes first, and just for simplicity, we'll imagine she just makes a, a simple two outcome measurements. And, okay, so let's say on one of the, the measurements, uh, the updated probability of P2 is, is greater, so we've, we've actually, we're getting closer to uh, equal probability. And then on another one, though, it drives this up. Okay, so again, the way to interpret this is this is now the updated probabilities, the difference in the two. So this would be, we can say this is A1, uh, A2, in terms of the Krauss operators. Uh, one thing to note is that, I mean, we're, we're trying to model the most general LCC here. And um, remember, when, what, when, we, when we first defined these LCC instruments, we talked about CP maps. But actually, what we can do is, if we can, which in general won't have... Um, just be a single Krauss operator in terms of its, its Krauss representation, but we can fine grain it. And we can always assume that every local measurement is just, just consists of a single Krauss operator. Okay, I mean, if we, if we want to recover a more general protocol, then we just we throw away some information and we sum over it. Okay, so, so that is the, the first one. Okay, and then, uh, then it's Bob will make a measurement of some sorts. And let's say here's two. But let's say uh, it's, a, it's a strong measurement of, of some sort, and now the, the bias is actually swayed the other way, like this. So this would be and something like this. So this would be A1, B1 given 1, A1, B2 given 1, etc. But now, okay, so this is actually a good outcome, right? Because now we see that the probability is, is close to 1. So what might happen in this protocol is if they got the sequence of outcomes, Alice got a 1, then Bob got a 1, they might say, well, okay, we're, we're pretty close to, to, to being certain here that it's, it's uh, tau 1, and so they might just stop here. Okay, so we're going to put a box around it indicating that, that they're going to halt and they're going to make their guess on this state. Because remember, this, this, this is a, an end-round protocol, 
So at some point in the very future, it's going to stop, and then they're going to have to make a guess. Okay, we're, we're, we're not, uh, I mean, if, if it ends at some point, if it's forced to end at n rounds, then it's, it always behooves them to make a guess. Okay, so here they say, all right, we're, we're pretty we're confident here that we, we have tau 1, we're going to guess. All right, and so then we, we continue this going on, maybe something like this. And so look, maybe at round n minus 1 here, uh, let's say it's something like this. And then, of course, like I said, in the, in the final round, uh, they're always going to make... They're always going to make some guess. So I'm boxing these guessing nodes. And maybe this was, again, jumped on the other side. Something like this. <clears throat> okay. So the first step that we want to do is uh, we don't want to have these. We, we, well, okay, we want to choose a suitable halting point. And so what, what I want to do is I want to say, let's replace every time the, the probabilities have flipped, where we've gone from uh, tau 1 being more probable to tau 2 being pro more prob probable, let's use this, this weak measurement and let's actually stop it. So let's replace this measurement here with a weak one where actually at round 2, uh, the probability is zero. And remember, we can do this. This is the, the whole idea of the, the pseudo weak measurement. Yes? I think uh, uh, P1 represents P2. Yes. Has that information been supplied to Alice and Bob, or you are, or for analysis, you are just considering that particular case? Um, well, no, th they'll know the a priori probability. We can assume that. Oh, okay. I mean, okay, if you're, if, you're, if you're thinking this is too restrictive, you could actually set them equal to one another, I mean, and, and then you would just uh, shift where this halting point is going to be. I mean, this is just a, a matter to make the, the calculations be nice. Okay, and uh, likewise, so here we're, we're going to, every time we, we, we flip, we're going to replace it here. Okay, so that we can do. Um, and so then, then we're going we're gonna, to, at this point, we've, we, we haven't changed the overall success of the, prob of the protocol uh, because, again, that was what the, the, the pseudo-weak measurements allow us to do. And we're going to group the nodes together. So we're going to say B1. These are going to be uh, the guessing nodes. Guessing nodes. Meaning that in the protocol, whenever they got to these nodes, they just stop and make a guess. So all the, all the boxes belong to B1. And then B2, uh, these are going to be the equal probability halting nodes. And I'm calling them halting nodes because we're just going to restrict our attention to what's, what's gone, going on uh, at this point in the protocol. So if, if we got to this point, we just halt it, and we're going to analyze it at that point. OK, and so the question now is, what is the error at this point in the protocol? So what <coughs> is the error? Remember, we, we need the whole thing to, the error probability can't exceed epsilon. Well. All right, so here it's, it maybe is helpful to ask how these states have evolved at each of these nodes. So, right, so if we have node, say, n, n lambda, okay, so each of these, is, this is maybe node 1, n1, this would be node 1, 1, 1, and, and so we can index each of these, these nodes. And so at node n lambda, uh, we have the, the state has evolved as follows. So this is p lambda tau 1. And at, this is these, these m lambdas here. These are the cross operators. This is just all the, all the cross operators applied up to that node. So we've just grouped them together into m1. Right, so, so and I, I want to emphasize that m, m lambda is a product operator. 
Okay, this is going to be very important that we, we can assume that this has evolved as a product operator. Uh, right. Over P lambda. And we'll say pi lambda then will be just the POVM element associated with this. Okay, so now, yeah, what is the error? Well, hmm. Yes, yes, thank you. Right, so this is a uh, lambda given one. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, you're just tracing over it, right? You're just normalizing. Yeah. Okay. Right, so now let's, let's do a, a quick error analysis. So for the, the nodes in, in this B1, Uh, what do we know? Well, we know that it's, I mean, because they're guessing and because the, the probabilities haven't flipped, the best possible guess will always be to guess P1, right? Because if we, 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 have, no, we have no guessing nodes where it's more a posteriori probable for P2 to ha have been prepared, so it always, the best guess is always going to be P1 for all the nodes in, in B1. So, uh, so the P error in N lambda, so this is for N lambda in, in B1, is just going to be the probability of, of that sequence of outcomes times the updated probability of tau given lambda. And this is just trace of oops, P lambda trace of pi lambda tau 2. Right? Again, we're assured of this because uh, the error will always be if they were actually given tau, t if it was actually, if their actual state was tau 2. Okay, um, and so we have this, this nice, the, the bound, the epsilon bound, that if we sum up over all the nodes in B1, uh, it cannot exceed P error, epsilon. And so this will just be <coughs> P2. Oh, sorry, this is P2, not P lambda. Right, because uh, I'm using this Bayes, Bayes rule here. Right, because, uh, well, yeah. And so then this is just the trace of the sum over N lambda. Okay, and I know that this sum here, because these were, these were each uh, product operators, I know that, that this is going to be some separable POVM element, right? We're just summing up over, uh, over product operators. So let's denote that as, uh, let's call this pi epsilon. Okay, and this is just some separable object. And again, we're calling it epsilon because eventually what we want to do is we want to take epsilon to zero. So for, for every, every epsilon, we can find this, this uh, separable POVM. Okay, now for, for nodes in B2, uh, I'm going to erase this now. So for nodes in B2, that it's, we're going to use uh, an error estimate that won't be tight. But we're going to estimate it. Remember, we talked about, uh, we, we introduced this, this lower bound in terms of, uh, well, first we had the one norm, and then we, we, we um, weaken that to this, uh, this lower bound in terms of the, the inner product of the two, the overlaps. So for nodes in B2, we have that. Uh, P error of n lambda must be uh, less than this one half p lambda. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, 
So basically what we're doing is we're saying, well, if we, at these stopping nodes, if we continue and we're, let's just, let's just uh, forget about LSCC. Even if we just made uh, a global measurement at these, at these halting nodes and we continued, we're still going to incur some error, and that error is going to be given by this formula. Well, no, I mean, we're not assuming that anymore, right? So, yeah, remember, so that, that, was, that was the whole point, is that you're making these local measurements, and you're going to presumably destroy orthogonality. And it's going to be very, very small, right? Here? Um, yes, this lower bounds it. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yes, right. I see. What were you asking, Andres? You want in the lambda there, I guess. Well, I mean, because it's it's the inner product of tau one, tau two. So. Uh, it's, yeah. Okay. Um, and so here, what is this p lambda? This is just p one, uh, the trace pi lambda tau one plus P2, trace. Yeah, OK. All right, so now we can actually, and this, is, this holds for all nodes in B2. So now we can state uh, a, a necessary condition is the following. And uh, yeah, again, this, the, the pi lambdas are, are product operators. So Okay, so the first is that uh, necessary condition is that there must exist some POVM where uh, this is separable and this is a product. Such that for all lambda, and uh, right now we're actually just this lambda is just some finite, some finite number. We're, we're uh, ranging over some finite number, and we have that p two trace of pi epsilon tau two is less than epsilon. And we have this p lambda. I'm just going to copy down right what I have over there. So this is the b1 error, and this is going to be the b2 error. And this must be less than epsilon. And then the final constraint we have is that uh, for, the, for all those elements in B2, we now have that the probabilities, the posteriority prob probabilities are equal. And so that is just saying that if we look at P1 tau 1 minus P2 tau 2, this should be 0. I, this is saying that uh, we've stopped it at that appropriate point where they're, where they're equal. Sorry, can you clarify something? Sure. It's P lambda. That's the probability that we arrive at node lambda. Yes. So the, because we have plenty of nodes, typically this was a very small value. Yes. <laughs> so the second condition is not, it doesn't look very informative. No, I mean, uh, well, I guess it, it, it must hold for this holds for all lambda. So, I mean, in, in principle, we could we could sum sum up over it. Yeah. Then you have a bunch of. Then you have, that's what yeah. I mean. Then you, then when you sum, you just have 
a huge number on the right. I mean, this, like, they would have expected. Like no, no, sorry, sorry, no, 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 this, this, no. Okay, you're right. No, that's, that's what I mean. Actually, yeah, this, in true, the sum on the left hand side over lambda must be less than epsilon. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it, actually, we don't we don't need that because when we let epsilon go to zero, it it, it won't matter because this is a positive number here. So, I mean, yes, what you said is true. Okay. Um, right, so at this point, it looks, it looks okay. Um, and, and so you would be maybe tempted to say, well, let's just let epsilon go to zero and, and we're done, um, and then argue some sort of compactness. But the problem is that essentially what Andreas was saying is that we have no control at this point over the number of lambda because this, there could be a whole bunch of, of these nodes, these halting nodes. So what we do is we run a, we use a theorem from convex analysis. So one thing I should note here is that we know that uh, this is, this is a, a, a POVM. So we have this constraint that uh, the identity minus pi epsilon is equal to the sum of pi lambda. Okay, and so this is going to be like our uh, another way of looking at this is that we can we're writing this as a, a, a convex combination of these pi lambdas, these product pi lambdas. Okay, so there's uh, say this is Cartier-Dori's theorem. which says the following that let S be uh, say a subset of Rn uh, and convex S, this is with the convex hull of, of all points in S. So this is, this is some subset where you take this convex hull then any X in S uh, can be expressed as a convex combination of uh, n plus 1 elements from S. So this is essentially how we're going we're gonna to limit, put an upper bound on, on, on the number here. It's going to be a dimensionality limit. Uh, so, so in our case, and I won't go through just the, the full details of the argument, but I'll, I'll just ex describe it. So we're, we let, um, we, want to, we, want these, we want to normalize these a bit. So we let S be the set of pi lambda over trace pi lambda. And then of course we, we, we can write this as some convex combination of, of elements from S. And what Carthiodori's theorem assures us is that we can replace that with some subset. We don't need to consider all the lambdas. We can find some, some subset of, of S. And we can write, express this as a convex combination of elements from that subset of S. OK. Um, right. And, and it'll be some dimensionality dependent. So this, this, is, this is some. This is Rn, so I guess it goes by uh, the d squared of, of our of our states here. Okay, um, so there's there's one there's one subtle detail here in doing this is that when you when you choose these, uh, you still want these conditions to hold true. So you have to make your choice a little a little clever, um, but uh, you can do this. And so you, so you've, you have a, a smaller subset of the pi lambda. And then when you let epsilon go to 0, actually, uh, with this reduced number of product POVM elements, you'll get a necessary condition. OK? Uh, but one, thi one, sorry, one thing I wanted to note is that when you make this reduction, you're no longer dealing with an LOCC POVM. So when, when you apply Carthidori's theorem, you've, you've just chosen product states. Or excuse me, not, not product states, product POVM elements. 
That doesn't mean that you can actually implement this in an LLCC protocol. So we're, we're relaxing the problem a little bit in order to deal with this. Okay, so then... Okay, so, so the idea is we can put some, some upper bound on this, some dimensional dependent upper bound. And once we have that, then we, then we take this limit. We let epsilon go to zero. And because we have uh, a product elements here and separable elements there, that's a, a convex set. So we know that there'll actually exist a limit point as epsilon goes to zero. So, yeah, so when you do that, so the epsilon is zero then implies that, um, we'll say this is the distinguishability criterion. Meaning this is just a necessary condition for asymptotic discrimination of, of two, two states. So um, for each x in this, this range here. There must exist a set of elements. So this is pi naught, pi lambda. Lambda 1 to, to d. Uh, and where this is product and uh, this is some separable element. Okay, such that, well, I mean, we're letting epsilon go to zero. So we just replace, replace these things here. So we have that trace of pi zero tau two equals zero. And when this goes to zero, we summed over it. So each of the elements in the sum must go to zero. And uh, this will be zero if and only if this guy is zero in here. So we can say that trace of uh, pi lambda tau one, pi lambda tau two equals zero. And then finally, uh, at the bottom there, we have, this is always going to hold. Yeah, OK. And D is, I should, should write, say what D is. D is, if, if this is, this, this is actually holds in general for, for n parties. So if, if we let, we square the dimension uh, something like dimension squared of the local parties. Okay. <clears throat> Can we give you a division into separable and product? Yes. I mean, how does one distinguish? Because separable is a convex uh, sum of products, is it not? Yes. Ah, so you demand that, you, yeah, so, 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 right, so you demand that the pi lambda has the form a lambda, b lambda, good, and then, and then this, this pi zero, it's just like you said, it's, it's just some, uh, sum over this. So you must be able to f construct two of these that, that satisfy this. Uh, okay, so this x in this, this, this range here, this was accounting for uh, the, the probabilities p1, p2. Because we're, we're free to choose those at, at, uh, at any, uh, originally, any p1, p2. So one is the sum of the other set, is it? So, sorry? No, one is the sum of the other, is it? No, I mean, this is, this is a POVM. So we know that uh, the identity is pi 0 plus the sum over pi lambda. Yeah? 
No, this, 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 is, this is the identity, so this is the resolution, the completeness. Yeah, but phi naught is also a sum of uh, products. Pi, pi naught is, yes. Yeah, sorry, maybe I, these, aren't, these aren't the same as this. You're not summing over, uh -huh. right? So call these, yeah, call these primes. Does that help? Yeah. Oh. No. You're saying the, the dummy index. It's not the same lambda. It's the index that is confusing, not the index. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Good. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, this, this is, this, I guess, you. It's P1, yeah? It's not, it's P1, no? Oh, no, oh, yeah. Sorry. It's a one, 1 minus x here. No? So just call this. Because P1, yeah, so this is 1 minus x and x, like that. I mean, phi 0 is sum of several things of the form phi, phi lambda. Of the form pi lambda, yes. Yeah. Yes. Now, uh, I think just by increasing the indices to take a larger number of values, I mean, how do I separate the my thing into phi 0 and... Uh, oh, no, it's the other condition. The second and the third condition <coughs> should hold for pi lambda. But pi 0 has nothing to do with the second and third condition. Oh. The pi lambda is, is just here. Yeah. So I mean, the, the way you, you interpret this is this, the x is, is, giving, is basically corresponding to the original probabilities of your states. Uh, this, this condition here is just saying that when you stop and guess at those box nodes, you, 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 should, you should not error at all. Because in, this, you, in the epsilon to zero limits, when you make that guess, you must not make a mistake. So that's what this is saying. This condition is essentially saying that when you halt, Right? And they should remain orthogonal. This is an orthogonality condition. And then the, uh, the third condition is just the fact, this is just indicating that we, we have halted our protocol when the probabilities are, have evolved to be the same. So it's equal probabilities. <coughs> okay, um, I want to say that I should note that to give due credit, this is inspired. by uh, the KKB paper that I've been citing, this Kleinman, uh, Camperman, and Bruce paper. This is PRA uh, 2011. Um, but the difference in their paper is they just, if, if you go on, they, they give a distinguishability criterion, and it looks a lot like this. But the difference there is that they only consider one element. So they only have one pi lambda. and uh, so then they don't have this condition. They basically just have, have, have the orthogonality condition with one pi lambda. So the, the, the strengthening here is that we, we are able to talk about a whole POVM. And that, this turns out to be the essential in, ingredient in order to distinguish these guys. But yeah, this was uh, the preceding paper. OK. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, this is, I guess, kind of nice. but. To be honest, I, I'm, in practice, it's, it's a little difficult to work with um, because, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, just, you're just the only constraints here that you have product and in, in, separable, and that seems very strong. But now if you're just given two, two states, tau 1 and tau 2, to check whether or not you can find such uh, construction is difficult. I mean, so I don't know. I, I've, I've, I guess I, I'll just say, sort of say this is a bit open, is, is how far this can be pushed. Um, I'll, I'll give one sort of implication of it right now, but, uh, but I, there's, there's mo room for more work to be done, I think, in this. Yes? Uh, the number of these lambdas. Yes. Uh, I mean, how to confirm that that's where the Carthidor That's where the Carthidor is here, I mean, yeah. Yeah, OK. So uh, let's, let's talk some. Some implications. Yeah. OK. I'm going to number this. So this would be one, two, three. Um, 
All right, so we're going to just focus on uh, the sp special case when uh, the support of tau 1 and tau 2, if we look at this, it'll span the whole space. Okay, uh, and so these, these guys satisfy this, this condition because we have a full product basis here. So they satisfy this. And uh, yeah, so this, this turns out to be quite a bit easier um, to consider if we make, if we make this, this assumption. And I want to just introduce a, some terminology. So we'll say that a, a set of product states form a local orthogonal product basis so this is what we refer to as a local orthogonal product basis if if we look at Alice and Bob's parts these are they're pairwise orthogonal in the set so I mean, we when we did the two the, the two qubit stuff, we talked a lot about orthogonal product basis. Um, but this is a, this is stronger. So we'll say this is a local orthogonal product basis if both of these are uh, pairwise orthogonal sets. Um, okay. And so why is this important? Well, uh, why do we introduce this this terminology? Uh, and it's it's a fact that. If pi lambda has product form, uh, then pi lambda has eigenvectors that form Uh, a local orthogonal product basis. I mean, this is sort of an obvious fact, right? Because we just uh, spectral decompose, decompose a, a lambda, b lambda. But it's, it actually turns out to be really important for, for, the, the, actually for putting this, this criterion in, in practice because um, this, is, this fact does not hold if we had a separable POVM. Right, so it really this is this is what we're trying to harness this this constraint that this must be a product element here, and so this is what we're going to draw our um, we're going to use as like the the tool here. All right, so let me erase this. Here. Okay, so now consider tau one and tau two, and again we're going to restrict our attention to to this where the supports span the, the full space, and let's also restrict um, x. So let's say that x is going to be in this region of one half and and one. So it's not going to be at the endpoints. Why not in the endpoints? Well, if, if we choose x to be 1 half, then things become quite trivial. You can see this because, uh, so if, if this is just 1 half here, then both of these are 1 half, and we just choose pi lambda to be the identity. And so then all these will, will hold. Likewise, if we choose uh, x to be 1, then we just choose pi lambda to be uh, 0 matrix, and it also holds. So we really, we really get the non-trivial stuff in, in the interior of that region. Uh, okay, and then let's let's denote the for each of these pi lambdas. Uh, look at its eigenvectors, and again, recall that this is this is going to form an orthogonal, a local orthogonal product basis.
OK, so let's, let's draw some conclusions out of this. So first of all, if, if, if pi lambda, um, let's see, well, how do I want to? Let's first look at condition one. So what does this say? So this is saying that um, pi 0 is, is disjoint from tau 2. Okay? So if, if that's true, that means that the tau 2 must be contained in the support of the eigenvectors of the, of the pi lambda. Right? Because we know that we have this completion relationship. And we know that pi 0 is disjoint from tau 2. Uh, so we must be able to find a set of eigenvectors that cover the support of tau 2, contain it. So there exists a collection of eigenvectors, e lambda, that span support of tau 2. OK, uh, now the, let's, the next condition. Well, first, we, we're going to use the fact that, that pi lambda is, is not the identity. OK, so it's not the identity. Um, so that means that it, it has uh, each pi lambda uh, has at least two eigenspaces. So what do I mean by here? That I mean by eigenspaces, I mean there's it'll have at least two non non identical eigenvalues, and we can we can partition it uh, into into two eigenspaces. Yeah. Uh, and and so now if we come over here, what this is saying is that we must preserve orthogonality. So. And these eigenspaces, so what happens now? So pi lambda, it acts invariantly on the support of tau 2, right? Because it, it, it can't map it into to tau 1, so it, it, it maps tau 2 onto itself. Likewise, it maps uh, tau 1 onto itself. And here, in order for that, to, what we're using for that fact is that the support of tau 1 and tau 2 cover the whole space. OK. So this means that uh, uh, yeah, every e lambda k belongs to either the support of tau 1 or the support of tau 2. OK, and then finally, we use the, the third, third condition here. Uh, and, we, and we see the following. Um, so it must be the fact that for, for every pi lambda, if, say, tau 1 uh, e lambda k is not 0, then we must have that uh, tau 2 acting on some other k prime must be non-zero. Another way of saying this is that pi, uh, pi lambda must, cannot be rank 1. Because if it was, then you, wouldn't have, you couldn't satisfy this. So for each pi lambda, we must be able to find two eigenvectors, right? such that one lies in the support of tau 1, and the other lies in the support of tau 2. Yeah, question? Um, yeah. Okay. At least one pair say it's a uh, e lambda k e lambda k prime, such that this guy is in support of tau 1, and this is in the support of tau 2. OK. 
All right. So now we put these, these facts together. Uh, I'll write it over here and say what the conclusion is. And while I'm erasing, I, I just want to note that you, you see that from this condition, you still have to do, I mean, you really have to play around with this stuff and, and try to understand the structure. So um, as, as kind of nice looking as it is, at least I, I, I'm not sure of a, a cleaner way to, to see these things. Uh, but, sorry? We, what, for value of x, yeah, it, there will be some other restriction. Is it? No, x is x is going to be in between one half, and we're, we've we've chosen it. No, 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 no. This is this, that, so this is to remove the, the trivial cases, right? So if you if you chose x to be one. Um, yeah. Right. Okay. So then the, the conclusion is that uh, from from those sort of facts over there, so that there must exist a product basis for support of tau two such that each element of this basis, each basis element, um, also belongs to a locally orthogonal product basis with some So this is a lot. I'll, I'll break it down. Product state in the support of tau one. Okay, uh, a picture might help here. I know it's 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 a little. So so here let's say this is the, so here's our whole space H, all right? And so this is the support of tau two. These are disjoint, and here's support of tau one. And okay, so from condition one, we know that we must be able to cover. Uh, the support of tau two with eigenstates, product eigenstates. So we we, sh we need to be able to find. Let's say these are our product states. So e one one, e one, or e two, whatever two, etc. Now these the, between themselves, this doesn't need to be an orthogonal product basis. We're not assuming that. But all we're saying, uh, and this this follows again from the fact from Fact three, that um, they, these must come in pairs, right? So, th so for every uh, eigen, uh, eigenvector in support of tau one, we must be able to find an associated eigenvector in the support of tau two, and we use the fact that eigenvectors of, of product states, of product L POVMs here, have this uh, local orthogonal product basis structure. So that means so for this guy here, we must be able to find some other, uh, actually, let's, let's make it clear. Let's just say alpha, beta. So this is just some alpha, beta here. Uh, in this space, we must be able to find an alpha, perp, beta, or an alpha, beta, perp, or some alpha, perp, beta, perp. So what I mean is that this, if you choose, if you look at any two of these guys, they would form a locally orthogonal product basis. Essentially, you're just taking an alpha and you're looking at a, fixing beta and finding some state orthogonal to it, or you take fix alpha, find some state orthogonal to beta, or you find some state that's orthogonal to both alpha and beta. All right. Okay, so let's actually now try to try to put this in, into play here. Because what I'm, I'm going to claim is that we, we, can't, we cannot do this for, for tau 1 and tau 2. And the way you can see this is it's helpful if, if you look at an orthogonality graph. Orthog. Orthog. 
So the way that we'll do this is we'll, we'll break up Alice and Bob's part. And I just want to look at, at the, the tau 1 states. So say this is, so this is state 2, this is state 4, state 6, state 8. Likewise, uh, 2, 4, 6, 8. OK. And so what we'll do is we'll draw a line between the state numbers if Alice's parts are orthogonal, and likewise for Bob. So we look at state 2, and we look at state 4, and we see that uh, they're non-orthogonal. So we wouldn't connect a line between 2 and 4, but between uh, Alice's, they are orthogonal. So, uh, right, so we would have something like this. OK, now we can, we can automatically conclude just by drawing this simple line that uh, if we look at the complement of this graph, well, with respect to 2 there, uh, we must have that 2 on Bob's side, 2 must be orthogonal to 6 and 8 because this whole thing is a product basis. And you can check that that's true. So we must have, have this. Uh, likewise, so now we go on to 4. And uh, so we see that on uh, Bob's side, 4 and 6 are orthogonal. And then we conclude that uh, 4 and 8 must be orthogonal on Alice's side as well, which you can see that they are. OK, and then we just can complete this picture here. So 6 and or here. 6 and 8, yeah, on Alice's side. And then, OK, that's already taken care of. So did we get it all? Maybe 8 and. Eight's missing something. Eight's eight and four for on, on Bob's side? No. Uh, no, this is right, yeah. So for each 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 node should have should have three. So two has three. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, so this is the, the, the structure of this. And this is actually, uh, this, uh, this notion of orthogonality graph, um, when they, if you look into the literature of this unextendable product basis, this is one way that they, they will characterize these in terms of these orthogonality graphs. And the structure of these states here are, are very similar. I'll, when, I'll write down next um, an example of an, unorthogonal pro uh, an unextendable product basis. And you can write down the same sort of orthogonality graphs. And they, they have this property. So uh, what I'm going to claim as an exercise for you to try and the exercise is prove that the support of tau 1 contains only four product states. And in fact, they're the, they're the four given in here. OK? Uh, and as a bonus, then, then try to compute the number in, in tau 2, in the support of tau 2. Right, OK, so now, now we're in a good position, because now what does this require? This requires that we must be able to find a, a product basis of, for support 2, such that each element also belongs to a lo locally orthogonal product basis with a product state in tau 1. But there's only four product states to choose from in the support of tau 1. And it's given by uh, 2, 4, 6, and 8. So, but the support of tau 2, the dimension, the rank is 5. Right, so we must be able to extend uh, five. Find, ex find we must be able to find five extensions from these product states into the support of tau two. But in fact, we can't do that, and you can see that from the orthogonality graph, because Bob. So let's look at state two, for instance. Bob is already orthogonal to six and eight, so he can't be extended any further in, into the orthog orthogonal complement of uh, the support of tau one. Only Alice can. Alice only has room left. She can actually. Let's see. So she can only jump to uh, 0 minus 1, psi 3. 
For any other state, if you look at it, each party is orthogonal to two other states on their side. So they can't be extended any further. So another way of saying this is there's only four possible extensions from the states in the support of Tau 1. But we actually need five, right? This is what we demand. We demand that we can cover the whole support of Tau 2. So there's just not enough product states in the support of, of Tau 1 for that to work. Yeah? Sorry? You mean just for products or in, in Tau 1? Yeah. So, oh, proof here. No, it's four products states. Yes. Do you mean four No, I mean product states. Okay, so yeah. You can't find any more than four. Yeah. Okay. And this is, this is one of these, I mean, this is a, uh, takes uh, advantage of the, the structure of, of this, <coughs> this state, this Tau 1. I mean, these, these tile structures is what gives you that. So we can think about that further. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so then I, I said I wanted to, to give an example of where this, this uh, an unextendable product basis. Um, so again, I guess... Using this, this line of argument that I just presented, it really, it really takes advantage of the fact that there's a limited number of product states in the support space of your states. Uh, so if we didn't have control over that, it would be, it would be difficult to run this sort of argument. Um, and so, but I, when, I, when I was first playing around with this stuff, I was like, oh, wait, there's, there's a connection because we know that these UPBs have this structure and that, that, that there, are, there are, if you look at the subspaces, there's only a finite number of, of product states in them. And so what, my thought was that, well, this, this, this argument could work for it, distinguishing any general UPB. Uh, but actually it doesn't because we use the fact, uh, when we invoke this condition here, we use the fact that the supports of the two states cover the whole space. And in an, un, an, an un, unextendable product basis, that's not the case. So an example, this was in a follow-up paper from from the original non-locality without entanglement, they introduced these tiles states. So you could probably, well, maybe think of these. And then here's the, the so-called stopper state. Okay, so this is, is known as an unextendable product basis. And it's a subspace, right? It's not the full uh, three, three cross three because you would need a, a nine states to uh, to have to be a basis for that. Um, and it's unextendable, meaning that if you look in the orthogonal complement of this subspace, there exists no product states. Okay. Um, and so this this was presented. I should give the reference. This is in well, it's it's the, uh, about the same time that paper came out. This was in. 2000, and uh, Barbara Terhall and uh, Di Vincenzo is on this, etc. Uh, okay, and what they they argue in that paper is actually they give a, they give a a more general argument. They argue that any UPB cannot be distinguished by finite round LOCC. Uh, the, the, the proof of that in that paper is, takes a few, few times going through to convince yourself of it. But they're, they're, they really only do consider finite LOCC. So it, it's an open problem. It remains an open problem to prove that for asymptotic LOCC, you can't distinguish any uh, UPB set. This particular example was only recently proven to be indistinguishable by asymptotic LOCC. 
And this was done in that, that one paper by uh, Laura and Debbie and one of her students. Maybe I can find the reference. Maybe not. OK. Well, it's in, it's, I wrote it down on the board yesterday. But uh, so this is non-distinguishable. by asymptotic LOCC. And this is proven by Laura Mancinska and uh, Debbie Long. This is recently. It just came on the archive maybe uh, two months ago. And uh, uh, one of her students, I, for, I forgot his name. I, again, it's written down. I apologize. OK. Uh, and so the way they proved it, actually, is they applied, they applied a criterion like this. but. Um, they really, it, was, it was sort of an algebraic proof. So where I, I guess the proof that I kind of gave for the, the tiles was more of a, a linear algebra based, you're just counting orthogonal subspaces. They actually went through and, and computed explicit. They gave a representation for the operators uh, and showed that it didn't satisfy the criterion. Yes? Uh, this, this one. Uh, yeah. uh, this MUB, this yes. Yes. No, it's not. It's just for this, right? Because again, the way they do it is, is it's they, they give a uh, representation, a coordinate representation of this, and then they just play with the algebra, and it really depends on the structure of those states. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So again, so the the, the general UPB distinguishability is is open. Um, also, so this you can see right here that this these can be perfectly distinguished by by separable operations because these are product states that form a whole basis. So the separable POVM just projects onto each of these guys. Right? So, that, so that's a separable POVM that distinguishes these. So, uh, so, okay, so, so the result is, is first is that we have that uh, SEP is strictly greater than asymptotic LCC for, for this ensemble. And also, then based on, on this recent work, also for this ensemble as well, because you can distinguish these. There's a separable POVM that will perfectly distinguish these. Another open problem is, is whether, given a UPB, whether you can always distinguish them perfectly by separable operations. So it's, that's not known either. Um, for three by three case, it is. I mean, you can always distinguish them. But for higher dimensions, it's not known. Another, another reference, if you're interested in this UPB, is uh, there's a. Uh, a CMP paper by Di Vincenzo and, and co-authors. Uh, and this is in 2002. And it's a very, very nice, um, thorough paper. So they review all these, all these results. And then they, they analyze the structure of UPBs a bit more. And yes? Can this method be used to put bounds on the error probability? Ah, unfortunately. Not that I know of, no, I don't. Because, I mean, you could, because this uh, limit, you can take it for a non zero epsilon. Yeah? I mean, this, uh, this Karasiodori trick and then go into the limit. Yeah. You would say, would, you would find that, you know, assuming that they exist a protocol with yes. zero zero epsilon, you get something similar like this only with some epsilon. Uh, OK. And so, I mean, you can print it and yeah, get yeah. something stronger, right? So it's not necessary to go. Well, no, but then you have, remember, we had that sum. We had all this. Yeah, no, of course, we, they were we, talking that it's very specific. It, yeah. OK, yeah. Um, but actually, so on Andreas's question, the one thing that they, one thing that was recently studied was to actually get um, a, a bounds in the LCC best guess probability. And they show that actually, it's for, for these states here, uh, the bound is, is quite poor. I think it's like 10 to the minus 12, I believe. Or maybe that's too small. But it's 10 to the minus 6. I can't remember. But in, in, uh, if, you, if you reference, look at this work, the gap is very, very small. So um, it's not, not clear how, these, how the two classes separate. OK. 
So I think I have 15 minutes. Great. So we're going to switch gears. And I really wanted to spend a full day discussing this. But we'll make do. Yes. I know it won't touch it. There will be a gap. It'll be small. Yeah. Right. OK, well, we are races we go. So this is, um, I guess, entanglement monotones that I want to discuss here. So I'll, the plan will be I'll just make a few general remarks on what entanglement monotones are, some, some very general properties, why, why we use them. And then we'll, well, we'll hurry and we'll, get, we'll analyze the structure of, of all bipartite entanglement monotones. So this, this theory was, what, the way I'm going to present it, uh, if, you, if you refer to uh, Gifford Vidal's paper, it's actually titled Entanglement Monotones. And this is uh, in a journal of... Modern optics, I believe, in two, 2000 or so. But it's, it's got this title. Uh, and it's, it's a very good paper. And I mean, there's a, lot, there's a lot of things there, a lot of areas to, to pursue and study. OK, so with just an entanglement monotone is just some function. Is some function, let's call it uh, mu, and uh, it's going to map our, our state space, our density operators, to some real number. And let's actually just demand that it's non-zero, OK? Such that uh, we have that mu of rho is greater than say, p lambda mu of rho lambda sum over lambda, where this p lambda, this ensemble, p lambda rho lambda, has been generated by an, an LOCC <coughs> instrument for all LOCC transformations rho to some ensemble, p lambda, rho lambda. OK? Sorry, notation's a bit, a bit messy. Um, right, I mean, if we really wanted to write this out, we'd say, OK, we, we look at the class of LOCC instruments, uh, and then um, we, apply the, we apply the instruments to our state rho. We get some, some uh, probabilistic outcome, and then we average over it. Right? So it's, 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 that's really the idea, is that we're, we're averaging over all possible outcomes of our LLCC measurements. OK, so I'll uh, make some, some observations here, some quick ones. Uh, first, so observations. Is that uh, if mu is an entanglement monotone, um, we must have that mu of rho is equal to mu of sigma if rho and sigma are locally LU equivalent. This is, I mean, obvious. But it turns out to have important consequences, right? I mean, because because uh, I mean, imagine that it, it wasn't. You can always revert your your lo local unitary transformation. So if if you actually decreased after performing some LU, then when you would map back, you would increase, and, and you couldn't have this. So it must be this. It must be invariant 
under local unitary transformations. Um, and the second is that, uh, I'll just say here, mu must be constant for all separable states. And again, the reasoning is the same, is that you can always map one separable state to another by LOCC. You can go back and forth. So what we do is we say, well, let's normalize this. Let's just say um, that whatever this constant is for whatever this function, we'll normalize it to be 0. So, and so we'll just say if, if mu is 0, then uh, well, if it's separable, then, then mu is 0. OK. So why are these interesting, or why are they important? Well, the first is if you, if you want to consider Yes. And uh, for example, entropy will satisfy that function. That, that requirement. The, the, the entropy, yes. Yeah. yeah. And the, well, the well, first condition also. I think it is the, probably the second one which uh, fixes it from maybe to entangling. This one, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sure. You could, you, right, because you could have monotones, LU mon local unitary invariance functions. Yeah, I mean, this is done. This is a, but really, yes. Okay, that was a good point. This is really what hammers down the uh, LOCC nature of it, right? The entanglement. Yes. Yeah. Your definition of monotone is actually LOCC monotone. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I mean, I guess I. Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, so from from this condition. Um, P lambda, mu of rho lambda, we see that we have uh, an upper bound on the probability of transforming, say, rho to sigma. So suppose we want to do this by some stochastic LOCC map, and we want to ask, well, what is the optimal probability of doing that? Well, it cannot be any greater than the ratio of the monotone values on, on rho and sigma. I mean, why is that? Well, you can see it. So if, if, if sigma is some target on your LCC map, right, then you have sigma over here, and you just divide it out. And so then you have that the, the p lambda, again, that's the probability of getting outcome lambda, uh, is upper bounded by the ratio. So this is, I mean, this is kind of easy stuff, but it's, it's important because it says that if we have some entanglement monotone, we can set these, these probability upper bounds. OK, uh, and so what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll construct some monotones for the bipartite case. And actually, those monotones will be tight. OK, so bipartite monotones. OK, and so the, the, first, the starting point is to consider the Schmidt decomposition of uh, A equals 1 to D. This is the square root of WA A. This is D. So we consider D, D by D system here. And this is A. Now, um, first observation, so based on this, this requirement here that, that the entanglement monotone must be invariant under LU transformations, it implies that whatever function we have can only be a function of the Schmidt coefficients, right? Because we can always rotate, perform an LU rotation, uh, and just change our local basis. So really, whatever, whatever we cook up, it must be, for, on pure states, it must be a function of the Schmidt coefficients. OK, um, and so what, we're gonna, what I'm going to describe here is a recipe for constructing monotones. 
yeah, again, entanglement monotones, LCC monotones is what I mean. So I want to uh, say lambda d, this is just going to be the probability simplex. So this will be the set of all probabilities. such that they sum up to 1, and of course that they're such that non-negative. OK. Uh, and now I want to consider any function that's acting on this with two properties. Consider any function, any f, and it's going to map the simplex to the real numbers such that it has two properties. Uh, one is that uh, it is symmetric. in its argument. So basically what that means is that, uh, yes, right, we can, sh we can shuffle our, our, our probability vector around and f doesn't change. And the other is that it's uh, concave. Right, so, well, yes. Yes. Uh, when we are considering the transformation from uh, root to sigma, the divergence also positive. Yes. Sigma yes. So in both the cases, that probability has that upper bound. Um, well, in, no, in that, I mean, if, if you're going from one to the other, then it's, it's one. I mean, because you can, what probability, you mean, ask your question again, sorry. Uh, this rho and sigma, you have told that they are LU equivalent. Yes. So both the transformation is positive. Yes. Right. Right, which is, which is, I mean, that's con completely well, consistent with what we have, right? So then the ratio is 1, so the probability is 1. Make sense? Yeah. Right, OK. So, so we, have, we have any function that has this property. Uh, and then what we will do is we'll define So for any, say, density matrix, uh, say D, D dimensional density matrix, just let F lambda, we'll define this to be uh, F applied to the eigenvalues. of sigma. Okay. So again, this is originally defined on just a probability vector, but we can we can think of when we diagonalize the identity operator, we essentially have that. Um, and actually so this this is it's it's well defined because we have this uh, invariance, this permutation invariance. So it doesn't matter, you know, what when you're assigning uh, if, you, if you're probably you're assigning eigenvalues to a probability vector, it doesn't matter that assignment because you can always permute things and it won't change the function. Okay, so then we define uh, mu and this is on, on the bipartite space by we say mu First, we look at define it for a pure state. Okay, so we define this as just the function applied to the reduced density matrix. And again, we already noted this before, but it doesn't matter whether we trace out A or B, right? Because uh, we get the same eigenvalues for pure state. So. I won't even write that down. 
So this is how we, this is how we define an entanglement monotone for, for the pure state. And now we want to get to the mixed states as well. And so then you use this so-called convex roof extension. We talked a bit about this when we discussed the concurrence in the tutorial. So here, this is for the mixed state. And you minimize over all the decompositions. Say psi i. And you minimize the average of this function. OK. And so then uh, the claim is that this is a well-defined entanglement monotone, meaning that it won't increase on average under LLCC. OK, and so uh, what I'll do, um, and it's probably a good stopping point, is I'm just going to prove that it's monotonic for the pure state. And then as an exercise, you prove that it's monotonic for the mixed state. And when you do that, this minimization is the key, right? So let's, let's do this. Okay, so for pure state, right? Okay, so let consider an arbitrary. Uh, well, first, it, well, if, if it suffices for, um, we'll just consider Alice measurement, and if we prove that it's monotonic under Alice measurement. Then it, that's good enough, right? Because we can always compose. I mean, this is how we define LCC. It's a composition of local measurements. So we just look at one, and if, it, if it's monotonic for one, then then it holds for all, for the whole class. So we'll let this be some look. I'll write it. Be some local instrument. This is Al's instrument. Hey. Yes, gotta go. Cut it. This may be a bit in Tutorial? A bit more, yeah, with a bit more yeah. calm and quiet in, yeah, in the afternoon. Yeah. I think actually, what I heard in mind. Yes. I think she, some of the things that you wanted to do. Yes. But now you are not going to make it in the next five minutes. Right. And uh, can you have another session? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, any in the evening? Um, yeah, I, I guess we could do it. So sometime in the evening. Yeah. Then when exactly I will discuss with Andreas and let you know after the yeah. break. So at some convenient point. Or I mean, even in the, in the tutorial as well, I could continue a bit there. Uh, because I, I mean, yeah. I don't, I wouldn't have a, a full lecture left to do. I mean, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, but okay. We'll yeah, I think you should take so, a bit whatever you want. To okay, do. good. Because the participants will find it very useful. Okay, okay, good. So then we, we, so we, we pause point, here. You can sort of bring it to a temporary closure. Okay. I mean, the bottom line is I'm not going to thank you now. Okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> okay, yeah, so we coffee break then. <laughs> okay, I pause. To not technically. See, at the end of last lecture, the last lecture, I thank the speaker ah, okay. of the institute. Okay. And so I do not do it now because your last lecture is yet to be given. Okay. Well, I'm, I'll hold that to you then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so, but uh, I want to tell you that uh, uh, this afternoon, probably even maybe this evening, maybe a very extended evening, because we are going to have a discussion session on the uh, general uh, right. uh, impression <laughs> of the school and the uh, additions to 